Well, good evening, everybody. We will go ahead and get started tonight. Good to see you here for our midweek Bible study. And I want to welcome all of you who are watching via live stream as well. Trust you've had a good week. And want to thank everybody for uh, being here, making the, uh, the trek into the school tonight. Uh, right now they have an awards banquet, awards ceremony going on in the gym for all the uh, athletic department. And uh, so there was a very uh, difficulty finding parking space. I think most of our people, if not everybody, had to park about on the street there and hike your way in. And, uh, but yet you still came in smiling, and so that was good. At least, at least uh, when I was looking at you, you were smiling. Maybe when I turned away, you weren't smiling. I don't know. But, but anyway, thank you for hiking. Thank you for being here. Uh, leads into an announcement to open up with uh, next Wednesday night. Next Wednesday night to avoid what we had to do tonight. Uh, and we will move the midweek Bible study from here to our house. And so, Lord willing, we will still have that live stream for you. Uh, but I am aware of an event that's taking place next Wednesday night. The secretary did email me. I was unaware of the event going on tonight. Otherwise, we probably would have moved it to our house to avoid the hike in. Uh, but because uh, there will be uh, more things taking place in the school next week, uh, parking spaces will be filled. And uh, to avoid people having to park in the apartment complex across the street and walk all the way in, uh, a little bit more parking at our house in our neighborhood and our driveway. So uh, 7 o'clock next Wednesday night, the 26th. Uh, we'll make another uh, announcement on that Sunday night, but just be advised we will be moving that to our house uh, for next Wednesday night. Just to mention a couple of things via prayer requests, the, the most recent prayer uh, page went out for our church family this afternoon. And uh, a couple of names that I just want to highlight and then uh, a name or two to add on there that I forgot to add or failed to mention when I sent it out. We did mention this this past Sunday as well, but continue to be in prayer for Goldie and her aunt, her family uh, with the passing of her aunt. Goldie's uh, aunt Priscilla did pass away this past weekend, so we want to continue to pray for her. And then also continue to pray. We have a couple of names uh, on the back of our prayer sheet. They're kind of scrolling down here. A couple of different people in our church are looking at uh, uh, the, a door to open for some different housing situations. But we really want to highlight the Garcia family, make that a matter of prayer this week. Of course, Sunday, this Sunday morning, will be our final service with the Garcias. Have a special send-off for them. Some special gifts and things we'll be giving them. Brother Anthony's going to be preaching for us, so you won't want to miss that service at 1030. Uh, and then later on that week, I think on about Monday or Tuesday, they're going to be packing up a truck and moving, already getting that ready to go. And uh, as of right now, everything that they've tried to pursue uh, has uh, not been able to, to come to fruition. And uh, so you, you might know what that's like, especially a little difficult when you're trying to work with somebody that's in a different state and you can't see some things for yourself. You're kind of dependent on that person. And, uh, and so the time is getting short. So we need to make that a matter of prayer for the Garcias. I know they certainly would appreciate that, uh, that God will open up just the right place for them and at just the right time as well. Alexa and I, we were in a very similar situation back when we were on deputation. Uh, I had about a two week window that I was in the States or in the States, in, in Arizona before I, I was still in the country. But uh, before I was continued traveling, she was about seven months pregnant with Pierce and I had a two week window to, to secure everything and move everything in. My dad had flown in to try to help us move some stuff. And it was not until like the night before I was supposed to leave, the night before my dad was leaving, that we finally were able to get it was the day after? Yeah. It was the day after, so it, it, I wasn't even there. We actually had to have some more help to, uh, to get some stuff in there. But long story short, God did provide the perfect place for us. It, it was just a, a test of our patience and our faith. And uh, so uh, we are definitely relating to what the Garcias are going through right now, but we certainly want to be in prayer uh, for them too. Our missionary of the week, one of our newer missionaries, the Patrick family to Nigeria. They are almost complete with their travels, with their deputation in the upper 90th percentile of their support. And they're looking to head to the, uh, the field later this fall. But they are praying and asking us to pray that their visas get approved. And so they need those to get into the field, into the country of Nigeria. So pray for the Patrick family. Pray that their visas uh, get approved there. And then if you would, add this name to your prayer list. We'll get it out on the prayer list for next, next week. Uh, but the name is Eddie Davis. Mr. Eddie Davis, you can put that under the health needs section of your prayer page or just add that to your notes tonight. Uh, but this is a preacher friend of our family, preacher friend of our my home church, pastors in Tennessee and uh, would come to my church just about every year growing up and preach a revival meeting. He was working on a lift earlier this week, about 20 feet up in the air, and uh, whatever happened fell out of that lift and was uh, involved in just a very, very serious condition earlier in the week. 
known there was a number of broken ribs, about 11 cracked ribs, some internal bleeding, some things of that nature. Uh, the last report I heard uh, tonight, right before coming to the service, he was able to be sitting up and feeling a lot better. And uh, so that in itself is an improvement. A lot of the bleeding has stopped so he could do that, but still has a long ways to go. Uh, uh, maybe needing some plates put in to correct some of those ribs. But I know we certainly would appreciate it. His church family, his family would appreciate it. That's Pastor Eddie Davis. And so if you would pray for him and uh, continue to be in prayer for these needs here in the days to come. But anything else that we can mention real quickly tonight? Or uh, if you have a prayer request or you have a need as you're watching online, you can type in the comment section on our Facebook page. We've got that feed pulled up and uh, we'd be happy to see that and add that to our prayer sheet and pray along those lines with you. All right, well, let's open up in prayer tonight, bring a couple of these things before the Lord, and then we'll get right into the Word of God and then we'll break up into groups and mention some more of these things specifically. But let's pray together. God, we do thank you for the opportunity to be in your house tonight. Thank you, Lord. Uh, even though there's a number of different things going on, we, uh, we don't want to complain. We're just so thankful for the chance to, uh, the open doors you've already given us to be here in a school on uh, Sundays and on Wednesdays and, and to be around your people and to be around your word. And whether it takes place in a school or in a classroom like tonight or in a house setting, Lord, thank you for your church and how you continue to build it as you promised that you would and how you continue to use your word to change people's lives. This time is so important for us as we come in throughout the week. Uh, we've been working all day. We are tired from the week, maybe even a little bit beat up, maybe depending on what circumstances we've already dealt with and faced this week. We need to be under your word. We need to spend time in prayer. I truly believe the strength of our church moving forward lies in the group that will continue to be steadfast in praying for your hand to be on these needs and to be on our church. We pray for our church family tonight, a number of health needs that were mentioned, but we also pray specifically for Pastor Davis, uh, Brother Eddie, as he recovers from his fall, that you'd be with him and his church family in his absence. Ask that you touch his body and give him a quick uh, a healing and a complete healing as well. We thank you for our missionaries tonight, and we pray for the Patrick family, Brother Garen and Miss Annalise, that you would uh, get their visas sent through. And then there's a number of paperwork and the waiting things that need to take place, but would you be with them, Lord, and uh, get them to the field, allow them to get to the field in, in a quick fashion this fall. And then we also pray, Lord, for your timing and for your will to be done with the Garcias as they are still searching for a place to live and the deadline is growing uh, closer and that their time to, to leave and go to Ohio grows closer. God, just pray you'd give them peace tonight, give them comfort, that you would also open the doors for the right place for them to be and uh, be able to use to minister to the teenagers in the church where they're going to serve. And uh, just thank you that we can trust that uh, you are in control and uh, your ways are not always our ways, but your timing is always perfect because it's your will uh, and your work being done. And we pray that that would continue to be take place and be true tonight as we look into your word and look into the life of Nehemiah. Would you use the truths in our Bible study to encourage us and to increase our faith? We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 10 is where we're going to be tonight. If you want to take your Bible and turn there, or if you haven't done so already, you can take your Bible and turn there as you see uh, the outline, the title of tonight's lesson on the board. But Nehemiah chapter 10, we've been going through a series uh, entitled, uh, 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 well, I forgot what the title is. I, I remember what the subtitle is, Revived, uh, re Rebuild, Restored, and Revived. They're rebuilding the walls. There we go. Rebuilding the walls. That's what happens when you only have two cups of coffee and not your normal three. So that, that's, that's the trouble right there. Uh, you substitute a decaf for your third cup instead of a regular calf. That was my fault. Sorry about that. Uh, reviving, restoring, and rebuilding. And uh, so far we have seen uh, the first eight and nine chapters. The walls have been rebuilt, uh, but now they are not just restoring their city. They are restoring and reviving uh, the life that is taking place within those walls, uh, particularly the spiritual life. In the past two chapters, chapter 8, chapter 9, we have seen revival taking place uh, in God's people. It took place in the seventh month, the Bible tells us. It was their, the equivalent of their new year. They had a six-hour long uh, worship service as Ezra was reading the scriptures. And then in chapter 9 last week, we noticed how uh, on starting on the 15th day of the week and the 24th all the way to the 20. Uh, third day of the month, I should say, they observed the Feast of Tabernacles and everything that that was 
uh, describing and depicting there. Uh, and then starting in the 24th day of the month, uh, the people had a, a, another uh, a worship time with the Lord where they were confessing sin, getting things right with God. We looked at how, what revival looks like last week. As uh, For three weeks straight now, three weeks plus, they have done nothing but think about God's goodness, uh, look into His Word, look into their own lives, get some things right with the Lord. And at the end of chapter 9, they, uh, the, the Levites led the people in a long, lengthy prayer that was very equivalent to what we find in Psalm 78, as it was a history of God's people, a history of God's goodness, uh, a history of the people's rebellion and forgetfulness, and yet God's mercy to them, just by context sake tonight, would you look at the last verse of chapter 9. They've finished this long prayer. They recognized, look, we were in captivity, uh, not for any fault of God's, but because of our own. He has been good to us. He's given us another chance uh, to be restored and to be revived. It's time that we get things right with the Lord, do things the right way. Notice verse 38, if you will, just for context sake, the last verse of chapter 39. Because of all this, the Bible says, we make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. And so chapter 10, verse number 1 says, Now those that sealed were Nehemiah the Tershatha, or the governor, the son of Hakaliah, and Zedekiah, or Zedekiah. And you see, continuing on there, really for the first 27 verses, it's a long list of names talking of the people who signed their name to that covenant that was sealed and stamped for the people to keep. What we're going to talk about tonight, the title of our Bible study as we look at chapter 10 is more than just a name on a page. More than a name on a page. Now we've already in this study uh, have drawn some analogies between the restoring uh, the new life that's in this city and kind of the new life that was in uh, our country at its founding. Going back to our founding fathers, we've talked about them a couple times. going to do that one more again tonight. But uh, just kind of go with me, if you will, as we get started. Back to a hot, muggy July afternoon in Philadelphia where the Second Continental Congress gathered for the most important vote in their brief tenure. The date was July 2nd. 1776, and the vote was regarding a motion made by Richard Henry Lee in favor of independence from Great Britain. Now, on that day, 12 of 13 colonies voted in favor of independence, with one, New York, abstaining from voting on that day. They were waiting on the consensus of their people back home, which were, at that time, favorably loyal to the British. They wanted to make sure they had the authority to vote at that meeting, which, which makes you wonder why New York sent delegates to the meeting to represent the people in the first place if they didn't have the authority to vote in the first place. But then again, this was all brand new. It's the 1770s. Needless to say, 12 out of 13 was enough for the motion to pass and gave cause for celebration. John Adams wrote to his wife the next day about July the 2nd. He said, it ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations, fireworks, from one end of this continent to the other, from this time forward forevermore. Everything that he described in the letter to his wife and more today actually takes place two days later, July 4th, because on that day, the Congress adopted the revised version of Thomas Jefferson's document declaring our independence from Britain. So on July the 2nd, they voted to be independent from Britain. And then the next two days, they constructed and revised the Declaration of Independence, but it still technically was not complete. You see, contrary to maybe popular belief, the document was not signed until about a month later was not signed on July 4th. It was signed on August the 2nd, 1776. New York still had to get permission to go along with this new endeavor, and the document was meticulously being copied and reproduced. But finally, 56 men signed their names to that all-important document, unashamedly, publicly identifying with the cause of independence for all to see. 
You know, we may know some of the names that were on the list. I'm not going to give a quiz tonight, to be honest with you. I do not know all the 56 names who signed that, so I would not expect you to know that. Uh, but we may know some of them. We may know some of their stories as well. We know about John Adams. We know about Benjamin Franklin. We know about perhaps John Hancock having the largest signature on there. He was the first person to sign it because he was the president of that Congress, so he took up the most room. He was the first one to sign it. We know of these men because of the success that Franklin and Adams and Hancock have, the prosperity they have after that meeting. I'm saying all this to help us understand not all who signed the Declaration of Independence were so fortunate. I want to read to us a following article that I believe initially comes from uh, selfgov.org. Trying to give it the right credit here for our streaming service tonight. Under, but I've seen it in a number of different uh, formats throughout the week. But the article is entitled, What Happened to the Signers? What Happened to the Signers? It says, five signers out of the 56 were captured by the British and brutally tortured as traitors. Nine fought in the war for independence and died from wounds or from hardships suffered. Two lost their sons in the Continental Army. Another two had sons captured. At least a dozen of the 56 had their homes pillaged and burned. It continues on here, given the story of a, a couple of different names. It says, in the face of the advancing British Army, the Continental Congress fled from Philadelphia to Baltimore in December of 1776. It was an especially anxious time for John Hancock, the president of that Congress, as his wife had just given birth to a baby girl. Due to complications stemming from the anxious trip to Baltimore, the child lived only a few months. William Ellery's, one of the signers, it says he signed at the risk of his fortune proved only too realistic. Also in December of 76, during three days of British occupation in Rhode Island, his house was burned and all his property was destroyed. Another man, Richard Stockton, uh, a New Jersey State Supreme Court Justice. He had rushed back to his estate near Princeton after signing the declaration to find that his wife and children were living like refugees with friends. They had been betrayed by a, a British sympathizer who had revealed their hideout. British troops pulled Stockton from his bed one night, beat him and threw him in jail where he almost starved to death. When he finally was released, he went home to find his estate had been looted his possessions burned, and his horses stolen. Give us just another one here. I think you're kind of seeing the, the gist of this article here. It was not all fame and glory and fortune for everybody who signed the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Nelson Jr., just the last one I'll read to you. Thomas Nelson Jr. noted that the British General Cornwallis had taken over the family home for his headquarters at the Battle of Yorktown. Yorktown was the battle that sealed the war, if you will. The British surrendered after the Battle of Yorktown. And the British General Cornwallis was staying in this man's house as his headquarters during that battle. After the battle, or during the battle, Nelson urged General Washington to open fire on his own house. This was done, and the home was destroyed, and Nelson later died bankrupt. So because of that battle, they won the war, but he lost everything that he had in the process of it. This is kind of a sad irony throughout all of this here, isn't there? Uh, what's the one I was looking for? Mr. Hart. Gives this, this is the last one here. John Hart, a New Jersey farmer, was driven from his wife's bedside where she was near death. Their 13 children fled for their lives. Hart's fields and mill were laid waste. For over a year, he eluded capture by hiding in nearby forests. He never knew where his bed would be the next night and often slept in caves. When he finally returned home, he found that his wife had died, his children had disappeared, and his farm was completely destroyed. Hart himself died in 1779 without ever seeing any of his family again. So on and on this article goes telling of stories of the men who signed the Declaration of Independence but also suffered a great deal because of it. It says, such were the stories and sacrifices typical of those who risked everything to sign the Declaration. These men were not wild-eyed, rabble-rousing ruffians. 
They were soft-spoken men of means and education. They had security, but they valued liberty more. Standing tall, straight, and unwavering, they pledged. For the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of the divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. See, to those men, when they signed their name to that document on August the 2nd, they were signing more than just their name. They were fully aware it wasn't just a name or a title that was going on paper. For good or for evil, their lives were being listed as well. Their families were being listed on that paper, and yet they believed so much in their cause, they willingly signed them. Willingly put down their name. It was more than just a name given when they signed. They gave themselves. I believe a major reason why the cause of liberty was so strong in the early or the late 1770s, uh, why it ultimately prevailed was because when people like these, those men, signed their name to the cause, they were in turn surrendering themselves. And I believe a major reason why commitment to the cause of Christ is becoming more and more rare to find is because when we sign our names on a church roster, on a membership roll, on a sign-up sheet, we sign our names, but we don't necessarily surrender our hearts or surrender our lives. If there's a theme in this 10th chapter, if there's a simple challenge I want to leave with us tonight, it'd simply be this. Our identification with God is made by more than just our words. Our identification with God is made by more than just our words. Now, it's easy to identify in one sense with our words. Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a tender at Hillcrest Baptist Church. I'm a, a Christian. I follow God. I wear the shirt. I wear the wristband. WWJD. I identify with Jesus. I believe in God, man. Well, the question is, does our life cash the checks that our lips write? Does our life cash the checks that our lips are writing? Are we identifying with God in more ways than just our words? In chapter 10, Nehemiah and the people publicly identify God, but more than just their lips. They sign a covenant. That's the last verse we read uh, of chapter 9 as a context, to start tonight. They sign a contract, if you will, with God, and they sign their name, but they understand it's more than just a name on a page that God desires. God desires my life. God desires my heart. So how can we identify with God in these ways? And what, how can that be seen by more than just our lips? Well, the people here in, in the Bible in chapter 10, they show us three ways. Our identification with God, it can be seen in our accountability to the people of God. Our accountability to the people of God. Squeeze it in there. All right. Our accountability to the people of God. The chapter is a continuation of the covenant that was made in the final verse of the previous chapter. A covenant, by definition, is a formal binding, uh, a formal agreement, a, a, con, a, a compact or a contract, a formal binding agreement. That, that's a covenant. In, in our uh, our day, probably the most common covenant that comes to mind would be the covenant of marriage. It's a binding legal transaction. It includes witnesses. It includes a signed documentation. You sign the marriage license. Well, this, in Nehemiah's day, this covenant was essentially renewing their pledge to keep the covenant that was made uh, back in Moses' day. We call it the Mosaic Covenant. It is the commands that God gives His people all the way from Exodus 19 to Deuteronomy 28. 
I mean, you've got a lot of commands in there, 600 plus commands that are in there uh, as they're around Mount Sinai, as they're there in the wilderness, still learning and still following God. They are saying we're going to get back to doing what God says to do in His Word. They put a seal on this document, the Bible says. It was a serious matter before God. A seal was made out of clay generally, and it was stamped still while the clay was soft so that when that clay hardened, the stamp would be there. It would never go away. And so when they write this contract and they sign it and they stamp it or they seal it, uh, verse number uh, 38 and verse uh, of the last chapter and verse 1 said, they're saying, I'm making a decision that I do not want to go away. I'm making a covenant and a promise and a decision that I don't want to change. Look with me at verse number 1 again. Look at who sets the tone with this. Those that sealed were, the people that signed it and sealed it were Nehemiah, the Tershatha, the governor, and Zedekiah. Well, who's Nehemiah? He, he's the character of this book. He's the, uh, the author of this book. He's the governor of the land and this time, and Zedekiah is the second in command. He's the vice governor. So the first two names whom the Bible mentions of signing and saying, we're going to do what God wants us to do, is the leadership. It's the people in charge. It's not just the political leaders. It's the religious leaders right behind them and the leaders of the families right behind them. So in the first 27 verses, you have 84 different names of leaders, which is also why we did not take the time to read the first 27 verses at this particular setting. 27 verses of 84 names of political leaders, Religious leaders, we'll say parental leaders, the heads of the families. When they signed their name to seal, to this seal, it was an all-out commitment. Because look with me, if you will, chapter 10, look at who is with them, verse 28. Look at who these people are representing. Verse, 20, verse 28 says, The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, the Nethanims, that's a special title for a, a special position of service that people had, it says, All they that had separated themselves from the people of the lands unto the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, everyone having knowledge and having understanding. So it was the men who signed this, but it was also the women and the children who were with them in this. So everybody who had understanding, so every child who was old enough to understand what was taking place here, five years old, six years old, seven years old, it was an all-out commitment, you know, just like those men who signed the Declaration of Independence. These guys are saying, it's me, it's not just me, it's my family, it's my children. We are committing this before God, first of all, and we're committing to following God before you all. We're committing to this. We're unashamed to let you know. We're unafraid for you to keep us accountable. I understand we are living in a day where accountability is not always a popular thing. It's not always a well-received thing. You know, if someone is missing church for a few weeks... I send them a text or Alexa sends them a text. Some folks appreciate that sometimes. You know, some feel loved and missed. And then others, we don't have a text back. Or then what I found is when people don't respond to a message or a visit or another call or another visit, those are more likely to be slipping away. And then what happens is they become almost hard for the FBI even to find. And then others... Don't appreciate the text and think our church is too nosy. How dare you ask me if everything's okay if I haven't been in church for the past month? Well, sorry, but we're not sorry. We need to keep each other accountable. We need accountability. We want to make sure everything's okay. We want to be here to help and serve and pray and anything we can to do to help. Accountability is not always appreciated, but it is necessary. I mean, think with me, why else would God take the time in His eternal record to record this long list of people who just signed a name? They signed their name to this document, this covenant. Well, Pastor, it's just people signing their names. No, it's more than that. It's people whom God holds to a special level of accountability. 
Because who did we say they were? They were the leaders. Political, family, parental leaders, religious leaders. God holds leaders to a special level of accountability. God holds us as his people, ones with spiritual influence to a lost world, to a special level of accountability. And guess what we'll find out happened in this, in this passage, in the, in the studies to come next couple of weeks. When these people don't do what all they commit to do in the rest of this lesson, you know what happens? Nehemiah calls them to the carpet on it. And that's chapter 13. You guys aren't doing what you said you're going to do. You said you're going to separate. You said you're going to stop this. He holds them accountable. Why? Because that's what they're asking him to do. That's what they're committing to God. We are willing to be accountable before you. I want to tell us, church, we need to resist the fleshly urge to shy away from that. We would be wise to embrace that and appreciate that because no one reaches a spiritual plateau to where they no longer need accountability. No Christian, no pastor, no missionary, no saint reaches a spiritual plateau to where they no longer need accountability. It's a good thing and it's necessary. And if we're going to be unashamed of God, if we're going to identify with God publicly like these people are doing, we must then be unafraid of accountability. How do I de- we identify with God in more than just our words? We do it with when we are accountable to God's people but we see a second way here as well. We see it by our submission to the Word of God. Our submission to the Word of God. Look with me, if you will, at what the Bible says, beginning of verse 29 of chapter 10. It says, They, the people, clave to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and into an oath, to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our Lord and His judgments and His statutes, that we would not give our daughters unto the people of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. And if the people of the land bring ware or any victuals on the Sabbath day to sell, that we would not buy it of them on the Sabbath or on the holy day, that we would leave the seventh year and the exaction of every debt." This is what they are covenanting specifically before God. Now, we talked a great deal about separation last Wednesday night. But we see here again, you see this principle in verse 28 even, that these people were separating themselves to wholly follow the Word of God. They wanted to be identified by the Bible, by God's Word. Verse 28 says, the middle of the verse, they separated themselves from the people of the land's unto the law of God. We are coming away from, so we can follow what God says to do in His Word. And again, separation is not about promoting all the things we do not do with our lives and elevating those. That, that's how you become a Pharisee. Biblical separation is about to whom we are separating. It says they came away from the world so they could separate, set themselves apart to God and to His Word. So they're recommitting to the covenant God made with Moses. The Old Testament law there was some over 600 plus commandments, but the verses we read, they highlight two areas specifically. They said, we're going to get back to doing what God said to do, and especially when it comes to our marriages and when it comes to the Sabbaths, to observing the special Sabbaths, even the special years of Sabbath. And they talked about, not even buying things on the Sabbath. They talked about uh, every seventh year uh, forgiving the debts that were owed to them the seventh year as God had wanted His people to do. See, they would not work on the Sabbath, but they had adopted a practice of buying from the Gentiles who lived in Jerusalem who didn't observe the Sabbath. We're not going to work, we're going to rest, but we, we can buy things from them. Well, the Bible never forbids that. It doesn't give specific instructions against that from someone buying on the Sabbath. But here they decide, we don't just want to obey the letter of the law. They say, we want to obey the spirit of the law as well. We want to devote this whole day to God. I find it interesting that at this time when they spent 
three plus weeks doing nothing but focusing on God and confessing their sin. Now they say these are the two specifically we are committing to observing and keeping ourselves accountable for. Having in the right marriages and observing the Sabbath like we're supposed to. So why these two out of everything that God told Moses and the people to observe? Well, when you stop to think about it, these two areas of disobedience were the main reasons for God sending them into captivity in the first place. The pattern of the Old Testament is that when the people intermarried with heathen people or pagan people, people who did not worship God, they adopted their idolatry. They adopted their false idols. And so God would allow nations like Assyria and Babylon to come in and to conquer and remove His people because God had been removed from His rightful place of priority. They were idolatrous, but it stemmed back to the, the, the intermarriages. Now, because God had been removed from His rightful place, also the people did not trust Him like they should. Now, what's the big deal about the Sabbath and every Sabbath year? Well, every seventh year, God had told His people to let the land rest. Don't uh, plant crops. Don't farm. Don't have a harvest this year. Let the land recoup and trust me that I will meet your needs. I'll give you an abundance during the sixth year. But every seventh year for the past 70 times, they had disobeyed. And so the Bible says because of that, God took them away literally so they could let the land rest. He forced the land to rest because uh, they, the, the people did not do it themselves. In 2 Chronicles 36 and verse 21, the writer says he was fulfilling, this was fulfilling the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. For every year that they had not done this, God said, I'm going to take the people away so the land can rest. That was 70 years of this. Say, so what's the principle here? When we identify with the Lord, will not only be unafraid of accountability, we will not hesitate to change our lives to be in accordance with His Word. We'll not hesitate to change our lives to be in accordance with His Word. And that's what these verses are all about. Hey, we're declaring publicly, we're signing our names, we're making this public commitment, we're making this plea for accountability as well. Uh, hey, listen, in the past, our forefathers, our marriages, they have not been according to what God said to do. We have not observed the Sabbath like what God said to do. And so today, we're committing, we're going to get back to doing what God says to do. And that's been the narrative, really, the past three chapters, hasn't it? Eight, nine, and ten. So well, why do we keep teaching the same truth? Well, here's an additional truth. Because one you'll find to be evident when your life is in accordance with God's Word. When your life is in accordance and submission to the Word of God, there's a third way that you'll find yourself identifying with God in more than just your words. And it is seen in our giving to the work of God. Our giving to the work of God. Now I would think this group has heard me enough to know my heart on this subject, to know this is not a topic that I beat us over the head with as a church. You know, September, we emphasize this a little bit more because that is our missions month leading up to our faith promise commitments. And the same token, when the Bible teaches this truth in the text that we're coming on to, then I cannot not teach it. And so what you find in chapter 10, beginning in verse 32 to the end of the chapter, the detail is given to describe how the people recommitted to giving to support the work in the house of God. In fact, in this chapter, you find more verses devoted to their giving than devoted to their separation. I'm saying God cares about how His people support the work of God in their place, in their local place. Just give us a highlight of these before we're done tonight. Verse 32 and 33 talks about reestablishing the yearly temple tax. And that was used to provide resources for the Levites and resources to continue the ministry, keep it ongoing. Verse 34 talks about the people agreeing to bring wood for the burnt offerings. You see, the fire in the brazen altar there in the, in the temple in the, uh, where the sacrifices were made, it was to be constantly burning. 
What do you need to make fire go all the time? You need wood. Wood was to be brought constantly. In verse 34, notice what it says, if you would. Verse 34 says, We cast the lots among the priests, the Levites, and the people for the wood offering to bring it to the house of God after the houses of our fathers at times appointed year by year. So everybody drew lots and had a specific time where everybody was supposed to bring wood to keep this fire burning. Everybody. I find that interesting. Not everybody in Israel could be a priest. Not everybody was a Levite. Only the Levites could serve in that area. Not everybody could purchase a certain animal. Not everybody had the funds to purchase a certain animal. You know, in fact, you know, God says uh, uh, some of His qualifications. You, you think about when Joseph and Mary went to uh, dedicate Jesus. They brought a dove for a certain reason. There were some sacrifices where God said, I, I will require this animal, but if you can't purchase it, I'll also take this animal. Not everybody had the funds to purchase animals. Not everybody could be a priest. But what was one thing, what was the one thing that God said, I want everybody to bring? It was wood. Everybody was responsible together to keep the fire burning in the work of the Lord. So I wondered, if we come to the house of God each week, our house of God, with the fire burning and the fire stoked in our heart. You know, that's something we can all do. What do we give when we come this way? How are we praying before each service? What's our attitude? What's our spirit as we come to the house of God? Those are one of the ways we give the spirit that we have, the joy that we have in this place. That's something everybody can bring to the worship service, a right spirit. Then as we continue on, verses 35 through 38 speak of bringing the first fruits to God and tithes to the house of God so the work could continue on. And that's still the same principle we follow today in the New Testament. It's a principle we see iterated in Proverbs 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with thy substance, with the first fruits of that increase. So the em emphasis on these verses is that they supported their claim to follow God, made when they signed their name on that paper, they followed through with it by giving in obedience to the Lord. I think the last words of the chapter really comprise the summary statement of the chapter. Look at verse 39 with me. Verse 39 tells where they brought all these things in the house of the Lord for the ministry. Notice just the last few words. It might be the last line in the verse. The Bible says, this is their attitude, We will not forsake the house of our God. That's a good attitude to have when you come to church, isn't it? We will not forsake the house of our God. We're not going to let what's going on here diminish. We're not going to let the work of God diminish. I like what Winston Churchill said. He said, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. That's pretty good. We make a living by by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. And the people in this chapter, in their newly rebuilt city, in their new life following God, they recognize a vital part of their new life will be involving their giving. And I'm not going to sign my name and just say I'm going to follow God, they say, without getting behind His work in my town. Not behind His work in this place. Materially, Physically, emotionally, financially, they gave to the house of God. I'd ask us, are we behind God's work in this place with the same attitude? I'm not asking tonight, is your name on a church roster? Is your name on a membership list or an active attendee list? I'm not asking if you have a fish decal, a WWJD bracelet, or a Christian bumper sticker. I'm asking what the Bible is asking us tonight. Are we identifying with God in more than just by what we say because we're willing to be held accountable? Because we're willing to place ourselves in line with this book and because we're willing to give to further His work. So why are all these things so important? Because when we identify with God in these areas, He 
can then do more in us and through us. Because the vessels He can use then are more than just names on paper. So as we go to prayer tonight, when we pray together, we pray in our groups, that this would be our attitude collectively as a church. Not just to be a name, not just to take up a seat, but to be involved, to be submitted and followed to this book, to have the right attitude and look for any way, multiple ways we can give of ourselves to further the work of the Lord here. Thank you for being in our Bible study tonight. We're going to break up into groups for prayer at this time, go through some of the names we mentioned on our prayer list. Lord willing, we look forward to seeing you in church uh, this coming Sunday morning at 1030. But until then, trust you have a great week. God bless your church family. At this time, let's break up and go to the Lord in prayer.